Uh, I, I see that you're talking, but I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, sorry. So I was, um, I think uh, now everything is set up for live stream and recording. Um, so let me share my screen and then we can, uh, 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 we can get started. Uh, and, uh, okay, share. All right. Um, you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. So, hi, everyone. Um, um, I'm really happy that um, uh, you guys are all here and thanks for uh, joining this call. Uh, today, we are going to give you um, like a summary of the contributions that we have been able to make during the research projects uh, that we had with um, Hansen Robotics in order to build um, a conscious AI for Sophia Robot. Um, so the goal of this project was to um, um, like fill the um, social common sense and ethics driving capability gap in the uh, Sophia robot. And we have been working on this uh, project for uh, like around um, uh, three months. And we have been um, able to make um, contributions that I am going to share with you uh, today. Um, so um, Sophia um, 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 mission is to uh, basically humanize uh, robots, and in order to uh, do that, um, uh, we I mean uh, we want the robot to be able to uh, communicate with humans in a natural way as we communicate with each other on a daily basis. And uh, the other, like there are uh, the other goal is to make um, robots. Um, an AI accessible to humans um, and uh, have them uh, contribute in a good way to uh, human lives. And also um, uh, um, um, they should be able to evoke feelings in the people that like uh, when we interact with them, we feel that they are alive and we are feeling, we have this feeling that we are basically interacting with someone who has feeling, emotions and can be empathetic. Um, etc. Um, uh, there have been multiple use cases for Sophia robot. Uh, Sophia robot can, can have um, um, applications in nursing, um, in childcare and ch children's education, in therapy and depression treatment, and many more. So there, there could be many uh, more use cases. And um, uh, in this project, we do not specifically look at a um, um, uh, use case, but we are just trying to feel to see what are the things that are missing in Sophia and what are the things that can be added or can can be improved there are um uh, current there are some challenges uh with Sophie like with um, conscious AI um, uh, and like uh, robots like Sophia um, um they are not uh, satient and conscious like um humans and um, there are uh, algorithms um that are being um, implemented uh for making uh robots act like humans but they are not uh, generally intelligent they are not uh, adaptive and they are not, they are not able to handle complex situations um and so um there are um there are some limitations and um um one of the um, uh, goals of this challenge was like uh, was to um um help hansen robotic understand um, um how these um, challenges or limitations can be overcome um um, so Sophie architectures is pretty advanced. It has um, a scripting software and chat system. Um, um, the face and the body is like human. It has some perception um, um, uh, aspects, like is able to do face tracking. It, it's able to understand recognition. Um, um, expressions and also um, um, uh, speech patterns, 
Um, it's pretty advanced um, uh, in uh, these aspects. Also, there are um, like um, from the robotic uh, um, control aspect, the arm, hands, um, um, the like the software uh, and the underlying, um, um, uh, I would say, um, operating system is all um, 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 advanced. It's working well toward making it um, 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 communicating with human as um, like as natural as possible. But um, as a summary, um, if I want to. Um, um, for why you a summary of uh, what's going on well and what's not um what's what uh, what are the rooms for improvement you have identified several areas one one area was uh, affective user responses so um um, um so right right now sophia is able to um, um for example um provide responses that um um shows intention that is able to work with the user it is um it is uh, there, there it shows some level of engagement and also um uh, it it can um like express emotions facial gestures uh, etc however um um uh, the, the current architecture is controlled mathematically it means that there are some rules and there are some um, 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 algorithms or um, uh, like um, uh, rules that, um, that on mathematical basis that are defined that tell her what to do. And um, and um, so, for example, um, the current, uh, however, the current um, uh, algorithms are not able to um, handle general cases and more complicated cases where there are um, um, attention to like um, a specific details and necessary details are necessary, uh, uh, like like circumstances in our um, daily day to day basis where there are uh, like um, inter cases uh, and details that we need to pay attention. Sophia uh, currently is not able to like not just Sophia not there. There aren't currently any robot that can handle these cases. And then um, the, the framework is not an integrative framework. It's not a um, um, uh, like the, the, you, currently all the algorithms and uh, frameworks have been broken down into different pieces. And every piece is um, responsible for handling uh, a specific aspects of Sophia, like, for example, um, um, facial gestures, a speech recognition, um, or um, handling conversation, et cetera. So um, a general uh, integrative framework is missing. Also, um, uh, uh, from the um, um, memory aspect, if you, we look at the memory aspect, there, um, there are she's able to uh, memorize some simple contents, but uh, memorizing um, arbitrary information and being able to uh, act upon the um, uh, um, um, the memory, the memory that she has based on the previous incidents and the past is something that is missing, and also storing all these uh, incidents and uh, important um, uh, details from the past is also something that is a challenge and is um, is open to question right now. Uh, regarding the imitation. Um, 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 regarding the imitation, there are some um, uh, dependencies uh, of the imitation learning that is currently available, uh, but it's not uh, integrated, uh, as I mentioned previously. So um, um, what, what can be improved is that we can provide attention to uh, and wait to uh, uh, important cues um, that Sophia see, and also we can um, um, uh, work on displaying appropriate emotions and gestures um, uh, based on uh, what has been learned in the past and what is currently being learned. Um, also, on the multi, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, just to, to interrupt for a second. Um, we do in our multi-agent ensemble. We have uh, neural agents, and we prime those with background information and the current con context. Um, and these are large generative pre-trained models, so they're not dynamically learning, but we do fine-tune them. And then they are able to handle um, open-ended 
the dialogue and they do quite well, especially in the context with um, the uh, prescripted. So this combination of the prescripted rules-based uh, dialogue with some inference um, combined with uh, these uh, GPT uh, transformers um, are, uh, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty powerful but it doesn't really understand the situation, so it does have it does have some certain limitations. Uh, but uh, but overall, it's uh, quite effective at open-ended, uh, non-prescripted dialogue. Yeah, thanks for the um, comments. Um, uh, so, and on the motive part, we know that the current uh, system mm -hmm. has several sensors that can uh, support interaction. However, um, we want uh, the system to be able to make uh, decisions based on the current internal emotional state and also the current goals and um, 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 understanding the context, context of the environment um, and the complexities of the surroundings and the situations. So um, uh, these are the gaps that we have um, identified. There are parts of it that are working uh, pretty well in Sofia, and there are parts that um, have uh, room for improvement. And during this uh, project, we have tried to uh, identify these gaps and uh, work on uh, strategies and algorithms uh, and models so that we can um, address these challenges and limitations. Um, um, so, um, we have, um, tr we have, um, uh, decided to, uh, focus on three aspects of, um, 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 uh, these, um, components that we have identified, or, um, uh, one of them is ethics, and we think that, uh, it, it is important for Sophia that when it is, um, uh, when, uh, it is, um, interacting with, um, uh, 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 humans, it is important for Sophia to be able to uh, consider ethical aspects of the situation because we do not want uh, um, uh, them to hurt human, but we want uh, them to, um, to uh, help human and um, um, uh, to be um, um, kind of uh, helpful um, and to a human. Uh, and people. And the other part is uh, about motive. Um, so uh, we know that um, the uh, motive in uh, autonomous robots can be very important. And also this is something that can be applied to Sophia. And the imitation learning is uh, also part that uh, there are um, um, basics uh, and there are foundation um, uh, in uh, the, the necessary foundation in, ro in Sophia robot is available and that can be uh, integrated and be advanced in order to build a better uh, or comprehensive algorithms. So I am going to um, stop here and let um, our uh, collaborators to share with you about uh, these components that we have been uh, working on uh, during the project, and they should be able to um, tell you more about um, uh, what, what is going on um, uh, in the project and what, what are our plans for improving Sophia Robot. Yeah, so... Um, um, uh, Derek, I think um, the, you are welcome to get started and um, um, move um, forward with your presentation. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, Marzad. As Marzad stated, um, we need to develop uh, the ability in Sophia Robot to behave in an ethical manner. And in doing so, um, we've identified the ethical principles that apply in the context of AI systems. And these apply to both the process of developing the solution and also in the substance of the solution and the solution being the ethical component to the robot's consciousness. Now these principles are beneficence, do good, non-maleficence, do no harm, accountability and responsibility, autonomy and human agency. That is allowing humans to be an active participant in the decision-making process. Transparency and explainability, fairness and justice, reliability and safety, privacy and security, and inclusiveness. 
So if we look at the next slide, this was a research project. So what we did is we dug into the literature and we found that there were three main approaches to the issue of machine ethics. A bottom-up approach, whereby a neural network is presented with known correct answers to ethical dilemmas. And this approach is, of course, data-driven. Top-down approaches, such as the moral decision-making approach, in which case they apply a utilitarianism rule that leaves the majority of people better off. And that rule is applied until sacred values are concerned. And thereafter, a deontological rule, moral, a morally obligatory rule applies. And I'll give an example. Let's say we have 20 people stranded on a remote desert island and food is becoming scarce. So the group decides they're going to kill the, least, the two least productive hunter-gatherers. That is a good decision from a utilitarian perspective. It would the remainder better off with more food per person. We run into the deontological problem that we cannot kill another human being, and that overrides the first rule. And then we have the hybrid approach, which combines the top down and bottom up, basically. So the next slide. Challenges with the bottom-up approach, uh, availability of data set, there weren't a lot available. Um, however, being data-driven does lend itself to traditional machine learning models. The data tends to focus on social common sense situations and outcomes rather than strict ethical procedures. With the top-down approach, we acknowledge that it offers the potential to enforce ethical principles and rules. It is rule-based, uh, but the question is, who decides these rules? For example, uh, one project we looked at was Silicon Capelia, whereby mm -hmm. the ethical traits were identified and these were de facto weighted. Uh, however, we don't know who in, who developed the weightings? Uh, was it a, an individual? Was it a, a group of people? So therefore, um, we've adopted an approach where we'll perhaps look at using the ethics data set to help with the rule-based decisions, but we'll look at that later. Next slide, please. So... With the data, the limitations and challenges, it's crowdsourced or scraped from social media. The question we ask is, do the values of the annotators or loudest voices on social media reflect community views and values? And to what extent are these values transferable, for example, across cultures? As I mentioned, there was a limited availability, availability of appropriate data sets and most focused on the social interaction, social common sense, basically. We did identify one data set that may be useful for a top-down approach, and that was the ethics data set. Look at the next slide, thanks. This uh, slide gives us a snapshot of some of the data sets we looked at, and those highlighted in red were the ones that we decided to investigate further. We had atomic, which is uh, basically fed our bottom-up model, and then the later iteration of that, Comet Atomic 2020. And we had the ethics data set, which was useful for a top-down approach. And the next slide, thanks. So why Atomic? First, its focus is on situational, social common sense learning. There is available modeling and documentation. It appears well supported by Alan AI at the University of Washington. And some interesting post-foundation work is being undertaken on common sense knowledge graphs. Next slide, thanks. 
So the atomic data set looks like this. If we have an event, then what is the outcome? And there's three types of relations in this. If we have an event, then persona. If we have an event, then that leads to another event. And if we have this event, that could lead to a certain mental state. And we'll look at more detail on the next slide. So this is an example of the annotation of the, uh, of the tuples. So the event is person X pays person Y a compliment. If the relation type is if event, then mental state, person X could be maybe wanting to be nice, wanted to feel good, or the receiver person I will feel flattered. If the event is leading to another event, it could be that person X will want to chat with person Y, person Y will smile, or person Y will compliment person X back. Or it could lead to the persona type event where person X is perceived as flattering or caring. Next slide, thanks. So the iteration from Atomic is Atomic 2020. And this is a common sense knowledge graph with over a million everyday inferential knowledge tuples about entities and events. It's a large scale common sense repository of textual descriptions that encode both the social and the physical aspects of common human everyday experiences. It's divided into 23 common sense relation types and these types fall into three broad categories, social interaction, physical entity type relations and event centered relations concerning situations regarding a given event of interest. And we'll look at the annotation on the next slide. Oh, sorry. That uh, diagram is depicting what the knowledge graph might look at like. Uh, interestingly, if you focus on the top left corner, social interaction that's drawn directly from the original atomic data set. And then it's been expanded further for atomic 2020. We'll have a look at the next slide, please. So looking at uh, the tuple annotation in a little bit more detail, and I'll just focus on the bottom right corner there uh, where we're looking at the social interaction type of it. X votes for Y. The intent of X is to give support. The effect on Y is they perceive they receive praise. The reaction of Y is they're grateful or confident for the vote. The vote and they want to therefore thank X and celebrate. So these uh, outcomes are all uh, based on what the annotator has perceived. The next slide, thanks. Now, this is a uh, diagram showing how a comet learns from an existing knowledge base, uh, which is a solid line, to be able to make uh, inferences about unknown situations. Comet is basically an adaptation framework for constructing common sense knowledge bases from language models by training the language model on a seed set of knowledge tuples. It's a solution based on combining the best of both worlds between common sense knowledge graphs and pre trained language models. And bear in mind, that it is model agnostic. So it can take any of the uh, training, uh, pardon me, any large language model. Next slide, thanks. So why do we need comet? Basically, humans can infer context, machines can't. Comet uses existing tuples of the type subject, relation, object as a seed set of knowledge. Using this seed set, a pre-trained language model, such as BART or GPT-3, learns to adapt its learn representations to knowledge generation. So we train the models 
to learn to produce novel and diverse common sense knowledge couples. In the next sense. Comet, work, Comet works by training the language model on a seed set of knowledge tuples from an existing knowledge graph, such as Atomic 20, 2020 or ConceptNet to learn to produce common sense knowledge. These tuples provide Comet with the knowledge graph structure and relations that must be learned. And then Comet is trained to learn to produce a phrase object of the knowledge tuple given the subject and relation. And next slide, thanks. And this is basically a model that puts the diagram that puts it together. We have the seed knowledge graph fed into Comet, and then it takes the pre-learned, uh, pre-trained language model, in this case, BERT from Sesame Street. And the result shown on the next graph, or next diagram, please. The result is a rich contextual knowledge graph. And these last two slides were taken from a presentation by Antoine Bozalou, who was part of a team who developed Comet. And I've included uh, the YouTube reference here, which is an excellent presentation, about 15 minutes, if you're interested. And can we have a look at the next slide, thanks. So moving to the ethics database as data set. Um, ethics was used to determine prediction of an ethical judgment. So for a given scenario, it predicts whether the given response is acceptable or not acceptable. And it determines which of the given scenarios would be the preferable one. We see that the prediction could be used as a filter enabling the robot to proceed, not proceed, with an action or verbalization. Next, thanks. The ethics, whoops, there we go. The ethics data set actually comprises five subsets justice, deontology, ethics, utilitarianism, and common sense. And each of these data sets have been specifically curated to that particular characteristic that has been identified. And next, please. So how do we see this fitting together at this stage? We have Atomic Comet, Common Sense Knowledge Graph, and we have the ethics data set for perhaps a filter. So we have the input, Oops, we have the input that the common sense knowledge graph would then enable an understanding of the social context, in which case the robot formulates a response and the ethics component would filter to ensure an ethical response. Now, this has been presented in a linear fashion, but it doesn't need to be so. And how it will fit together ultimately depends on our greater understanding of the robot's architecture. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to my co-collaborator, Reem, who will discuss reinforcement learning possibilities. Thank you. Okay, so we believe that we could leverage from bottom-up and top-down approach by building a hybrid approach based on reinforcement learning. So we are trying to build an agent that's trying to act ethically according to the current state, desired goals and motives. Um, so in order to do so, we have to, in order to do so, there are some points we need to take care of. Like the first thing is the data set, which since it's an RL based, Agent, so we need to have a data set. So we believe to have a human interaction data set, which is based on ethics and Comet data set. In addition to that, it could have features that Sophia precedes, like the visual input and the speech input. So we're trying to build a data set that is based on ethics and Comet. And in addition to that, it should fit with um, Sophia. 
Another thing we need to take care of is the alignment. So when we want the agent to act, basically we want it to act according to the current state, to do an action related to what she is saying. We don't want um, to do an action that is not related. Another thing is to have a goal generator. We want the robot to act basically according to a current a current goal and a current motive, what she wants to do now, why she is doing that. And some configuration for the reinforcement learning, like the reward function, how to build a suitable reward function for the RL agent to build a good policy, and how to compromise between different things, like I want to act ethically according to goal and to match the spoken text. Next slide, please. So, this is a top overview about the architecture. So we have an RL agent. The input state is the person in front of me, text, and their action. And in addition to that, the text that I am going to say. So Sophia has an alert, a good dialogue controller. So it's already producing what she's going to say in this situation. So we need to design with which is the appropriate action to do with the text. So this state is fed to our agent. The agent tried to make a decision and according to this decision, it gets um, some reward. The first reward is reward ethical, is the agent doing an ethical action in the current state. And we have a goal generator, which is also an input to our state. And we have a reward dependence, which penalize the agent if it is doing an action that should not be done in this state. And we also do have um, a text paraphraser, which is act like an empathy or trying to change the text to match Sophia internal state currently. Next slide. So beginning with our proposed data set, so we propose a human interaction data set, which is based on Essex and Comet because they are um, large data sets based on social common sense and behavior. So it's good to leverage from them. And we need to have the representation, which is extracted from Sophia, like text, the video, the image features, the sensory input. And we need also some additional feature to improve interpretability, like motives, goals, and internal state, because we need to understand why she is doing this action. So we need a lot of features to understand why she is taking that to maybe uh, get a better feeling if the agent we have built is good or not. Next slide. Um, so how we are going to build a data set, we are going to scrap and have videos 30 seconds of a daily human interaction and from this we are going to extract visual features and the speech and we're going to manually annotate them insert the goals the motives and the emotion and we are going to use Essex and comet data set to give us ethical judgment and ethical score next slide um, another thing we've talked about is the goal generation. We want the agent to act basically based on the context and the goals. So we need to add a goal generator module. And this is, could be done in two ways. Language condition goal generator, which is based on text, or we build an RL agent to produce appropriate goals. Next slide. So in the first method, a language condition goal generator, our, it's based on transforming the state into a text and this text is used to generate the goal for the current state. So we have, we encode the current state speech, the action in sentences, and we input this to a model and the model produce a goal. And normally this model is again, yeah, so in order to build the modeling, we need to build again, and its input is an embedding based on the state represented by text. Next slide. Um, another approach is goal generation using reinforcement learning. So in the previous one, we just take the sentence and fit it to again. But some have pointed out that 
this might not be good because maybe the goal currently may be great, but the agent could not learn um, a, a good policy, a good reinforcement learn, a good policy to do this action or to be able to execute this action. So the here we they incorporated a reinforcement learning agent. So we have uh, our state, our state will be inputted to again and again will uh, output the goals. The goals are fed to an RL agent and the reinforcement learning agent is trying to learn a good policy. And based on this policy, it, it should update the game because some action could not be achieved for the current goal and we could not learn a good policy for that. So, the RL is trying to optimize again and again is trying to, to make sure that we get a good policy that achieve most of the goals um, generated. Next slide. So we have the current state encoded and we fit it into again, the GAN output Z. Set of desired goals, the RL agent tried to learn a good policy and it produces a result, which is a probability of success of each generated goal. And this is fit to the GAN. So again, it's trying to adjust this model so that the probability of success is increased for all the goals. Um, next slide. Finally, we'll talk about the RL configuration for the SX part. So we have we define the root function, which is the most crucial part for an RL agent to success. We believe we could have a three reward function, reward is sickle, so which measure if the action is taken is ethical and meets the context. And we could get the score from SX or comment models. The other, the other reward is reward goal. Does the action is taken, which is ethically meets the current goals that we have set or not? And we have a reward dependence, it's like how is the text and the action associated together or they are completely independent. Next slide. So how do we calculate these rewards? So for reward ethical, we believe we could use a top-down score from SX or Comet, or we could use an inverse reinforcement learning to learn the reward functions and use this reward function to build our intended RL ethical model or we could handcraft these rewards. For the, word, for the reward goal, we could either handcraft them or we could use an inverse reinforcement learning technique. Um, for reward dependence, we believe that we could build a model that measures the similarity coefficient between an action and the current state of text that's being set. For the reward, SQL, we could use a top down data set like the SX data set. Since the SX data sets have a pre built model, we could use these models to give us a probabilistic score for each filter, and we could sum or take the mean of these scores, and this would be our reward. Um, in addition to that, we could use Comet data set, and we will be interested in the effect and react and other fields and seen as. This will give us an intuition if the action have a good consequences or not. And we could um, make this uh, text into scores easily. Next slide. Um, another way we said we could handcraft them. And in order to do so, we're going to use an equation which is measures um, the divergence between the probability of taking this action in the current state with the human probability to take this action in the current state, and we and we multiply this divergence with a constant. The constant is positive if if the probability aligned together, and the constant is negative if the probability should be low and our agent. Uh, outputted a high probability. Next slide. The last thing is to use inverse reinforcement learning. In normal reinforcement learning, we have a reward function and we have an environment and the agent 
learn and try to reduce our behavior or policy. In inverse, in inverse reinforcement learning, we have the environment setting, the optimal behavior, which is what the agent should do. And we try to learn what should be the reward function for this problem. Next slide. The last one is the reward dependence. So we believe we could build a model that measures the similarity between an action and text. In order to do so, we need to build a data set which should have like a goal and intent and topic, and it should output a list of actions ranked with their probability so we could know this action is good for this state and this text or not. Next slide. So we have some open design questions. So do we need a paraphraser or empathetic paraphraser? Do we need to change the text that Sophia is going to say according to the current state or just stick with the output? Another thing, um, if you are going to use a goal generator reinforcement learning, do we need to build a two reinforcement learning, one for goal generator and one for the SX part? And if we do so, um, should we always stick to the policy generated by the SEK reinforcement learning or should we switch between them? So that's uh, one question. Or should we build uh, one reinforcement learning that optimize between goals that try to be a multi-objective, improve the GANs, learn a policy for the goals encoded in its SEK part? Or should we stick to building a normal GAN for goal generation. Lastly, which reward design should we need? Do we need a handcraft? Do we need to handcraft the words or use an inverse reinforcement learning? Next slide. So um, we believe this should be an overall integration of all modules. We have a visual subsystem, which takes visual input, and we have the speech subsystem, which transposes the speech and things said into text. This is fit to a large module which contain uh, a dialogue controller which produces what Sophia is going to say and we have a goal generator which takes an input from motives and output signals for the SX and for the SX to generate uh, the actions that's going to say and for the imitation learning part so that uh, imitation learning module starts to work and learn the current action. And for the motives, it should influence this Sophia internal state. And the SX and paraphrasing should take a dialect controller, the goal generation input and produces what action should, be, should we do and the speech should be said and we should rank these actions according to the importance of the goals. And finally, we should take um, fed a signal to the motor movement and speech generator so that Sophia uh, say and makes the action. And of course, we have a memory part so we could keep track of what we have learned, what we have not learned, and so on. Um, okay, so um, I will, I have finished, I will give the floor to my co collaborators, Fidura and Mario. Thank you so much, Rim. This is a lovely presentation. Okay, so let's go forward with um, motives component. Okay, so the main question, what are they and why are they so important to sign autonomous robots? So first of all, the, the motives are the reason they, they, or for human behavior and their actions. Uh, if a goal is stimulate and direct these behaviors, then they are called a motivation. And this motivation is, at the end, a state of activity that is controlled by motives, okay? So uh, the, mo the motivation lasts until a specific goal is reached or another motive has a higher priority, uh, has a higher priority. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So uh the criteria of a motive is defined by, by by four okay that is activation direction intensity and duration so activation uh means how stimulated it is by a, a behavior direction is uh, towards which a specific goal okay intensity 
what is the uh, occurrence of, of this uh, of, of the action for this motive for this motivation and the duration how long will uh, it is being maintained for that specific goal okay let's go to the next slide so one of the previous researches that uh, we saw is that uh, there was a research that can look on the, the conversation and see how it can detect uh, the motive, okay? They use some motive label such as classification, SBM, CNN, and so on. At the end, they train it about uh, 100 degree globe embedding train on six billion tokens. Uh, use it by uh, from Wikipedia and Ginga work. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So, what are those motives? Uh, how many are there? Are uh, seven seven motives that they took into consideration that are self fulfillment, embrace and explore life, appreciation, beauty, social relation, health, ambition, ability, and finance. So, just by giving you a, a quick example here. Uh, we have a definition and a time label. So, for example, for self-fulfillment, we have uh, its definition, finding meaning in life, feeling satisfied with one's life. So, uh, according to the, uh, those researchers, they label the coin to the motives, and they say, okay, let's say for self-fulfillment that is, uh, a bill is by far the best bill in New York. So, for each one motive, they do this so that they can detect accordingly. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it, uh, they use it some multi-level sentence classification. So the ML, uh, uh, as a result, the MLP classifier performed better or on par as the SSBM in F1 measure terms, okay? Uh, however, we saw that the SBM classifiers had a low recall, which means that it's insufficient to detect various motives. Particularly when it comes to uh, detect the uh, the motives, we can say that if we use transablary, that will give you give us a lot of uh, precision increasement. So at, at the end, it, it still needs a little bit of research since there is a, a lot of gap between humans and automatic detectors. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, nice. So uh, we we discussed internally in the motivation subsystem system for several, for several previous models in total 10, okay. Let's go to the next slide, please. So that uh, we can see what's the overall of a system for uh, to perform their motives, how is the motivation, and so on. So we saw these ten uh, models. As we can as we can see, some of them are uh, based on some theories or are based on previous models, like like the PSI theory or uh, the Tranduk Tao synthesis. Okay, so most of them. Uh, what they have internally in their in their components is that whether they have some uh, uh, some mo motiv motivation, they have some behavior decision, uh, or they have some reactive subsystem, so that they take they took into consideration their environment. Okay, on the on the one hand, and on the other hand, they take in consideration their internal uh, states. Whether uh, it can it can be some urges, it can be some uh, goals, planning, and even they take into consideration the memory. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So, by taking into, into consideration this the, uh, previous models, we made the following proposal of a motivational system. So, uh, at the early beginning, we, we can see at the bottom the first layer that is the environment, where uh, all the sensors and devices. Uh, they measure geometric and physical properties of uh, of the the robot and its environment and other agents, so that uh, we we can sense the rotation, velocity, acceleration, distance of other objects, other agents, okay, and also for other other things. Then uh, uh, all this information is encoded and passed to the layer two, uh, la layer two, uh, where. Where is uh, where is connected to a predefined set of needs, okay? And this subsystem contains all the needs associated with a given robot goal. Here, uh, we suggest the use of existence and relativeness needs. Uh, this kit can be updated later. Um, af after after this process, we have the, the creme de la creme that is the layer three motivation system. Here. Uh, 
we propose the use of uh, of artificial body consciousness uh, based on uh, previous research. Uh, okay, that uses a synthetic neurotransmitter and and motivation, including a bi biological inspired emotion system. Okay, uh, at the end, we we uh, we we will see that uh, the individual behavior embodiment of the robot is built up a learning organism naturalness. Okay which can make the robot perform a spontaneous decision and after its natural posture. So, and then, uh, as I mentioned, it, uh, one of the uh, models that we raised, uh, what we saw was based on Tranduk tau synthesis, which will be the same in this case, okay? And we see that uh, this uh, consciousness basic architecture, meaning this is that theory, okay? Uh, in which the consciousness level ranges from low levels, such as that observed in uh, protozoa, to the higher level of humans. So, so that we can say that the level one of consciousness could be like a jellyfish, okay, and the most uh, higher level consciousness will be a, a human. Okay. Uh, then uh, at the end, this uh, the the last layer will be the motivation selection. That is, uh, is not only based on the output of the motivation system itself, but also on input from two other components, the emotion and goals. So that uh, in, in this case, the emotion uh, will be a set of configurations of the cognitive system of an individual, and the goal and the goals will be uh, explicit goals, maybe set of uh, uh, based based on, on drives, okay, which could be primarily derived, and the current goal is then used in action making so that it can take its own uh, action centers, action centered uh, system. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So how, how do we plan to implement uh, our proposal in this case? Uh, we, we are likely to implement the Circopedia, which is a framework that um, stimulates how an agent, uh, agency relates to another agency and then what actions to perform. Uh, according to affective states. So it, it takes into consideration uh, emotional states, okay? This this framework is meant to, uh, for determining affective states, okay? And so so, so that we can make all, also the action submission. Uh, the, the good thing about Silicon Coppelia is that it takes into account ambiguous, uh, ambiguous emotions and also ambiguous feelings. Uh, it's quite to be like human, human-like. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So, uh, what is the what is the process that it, it takes in the Silicopelia? So, we have here a graphical representation of interactively perceiving and experiencing fictional character. Okay, which at the early beginning we can see all all the uh, external factors, internal factors that are being considered and encoded, like ethics, affordance, aesthetics, and epistemics. Uh, these are features that are observed and then encoded, okay, so that later you can match it with the beliefs uh, that the agent holds, okay, that is the relevance and balance. And later, this, uh, uh, the, uh, this, this comparison coming within the, with the other engines so that it can evaluate the engagement in terms of the involvement and the distance. And also, uh, it can see, uh, it, it, it can take the intentions to make use of the observed features of the other agents, okay? Other, other agency. Uh, at the end, uh, all, all the responses, all, all the features, uh, all the considerations will be taken into account into, into the last uh, part that is the satisfaction level, okay? So that the agent can take a decision. Can we go to the next slide, please? So as, as at the early beginning, as I mentioned it, the models are uh, realizing considering four characteristics, activation, direction, intensity, and duration. But uh, the multis satisfaction at the end is calculated depending on the distance uh, to, to its goal and determined by the other, by, by the persons, okay? Uh, when it's calculated, uh, the, the agent would, will involve some actions and stimulate until it is, uh, reached out or inhibit by other motive, as I mentioned in the early beginning. Cool. Uh, so far, uh, th this is the last part of the motives. Uh, then I, I would like to handle uh, the microphone to my mate, Vidura, which will present imitation learning. Uh, thank you, Mario. I think you guys can hear me. Can you 
confirm that I'm audible or not. I think I'm. Your you your volume there? is just a little low, Vidura. Yeah. So I think you can hear me. So, uh, like, uh, hi, and uh, hi everyone. So, I think uh, you have a wonderful evening. I think the, most of the participants have joined from the live streaming also. So, uh, now I would like to present the imitation learning process. So, uh, when you are talking about the imitation learning, uh, yeah, next slide. So, uh, there are several attempts that we have tried to attempt uh, and try in our scope. I mean, uh, um, we, sorry, Vidura, uh, it's um, if we have a hard time hearing you, you need to uh, speak a bit louder. Okay, uh, yeah. Just, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Louder? It's not louder, it, it didn't change at all. Okay, how about now? I think you can hear me now. Uh, we can hear you, but it's uh, you need you need to uh, speak louder, it's it's not um, clear, yeah. About the imitation and consciousness, I think uh, now it's not uh, obvious what you are saying. It's, it's you are speaking, you need to speak louder, or I don't know why, but we can't hear you loud enough. So, yeah, uh, talking about the imitation and consciousness, so uh, we need to understand that. Uh, I mean, uh, we have to, focus um, Vidora, I'm not sure if this is with me or like uh, everybody else can hear you. Uh, clearly does everyone mm, is everyone able to hear Vidora clearly no I can't hear him clearly yeah I I can't either so I think um, um, maybe you can uh, leave and go back again uh, join again because there are some issues with the voice so we can hear you clearly But no. Vidora? How about now? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, it's better. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, what I what I have just spoken about is uh, imitation and communication. So uh, Talking about our project, so we have consistent digital ethical framework and multiple frameworks, and also the imitation learning. So when we are talking about all the imitation and consumption systems, so the fundamental part of human learning is that uh, we have to understand uh, several points. The first one is the uh, this is a, like a big challenge for our like, project. So we have read several research papers and we have read like uh, several research articles about imitation learning 
and uh, so we have identified that this is a very fundamental thing human led and uh, we have identified there are several human led robot projects also and uh, for uh, under the same thing that they have tried to build consciousness and uh, when we are considering those things so there are five things that uh, five points that we have in common first one is higher order intelligence so the higher order intelligence is very important because uh, it actually involves the human cognitive and social development and uh, the second one is that so we are able to distinguish self and others so when we are talking about the meditation learn actually what it means like able to mimic the human behavior human behavior able to identify the human behavior and mimic itself so when we are talking about that uh, it is able to distinguish self and and others and uh, the third one is recognizing a behavior of others and it's actually which actually calls consciousness so uh, this consciousness is very a uh, unique thing actually that's the difference between a robot or human and a human so let's say if there is a uh, like a room that uh, like uh, has like there are five members in the room and they are all friends so the six there is a six members who are entering to the room so if we are humans if we are close to that friend so we feel like okay after a long time okay, uh, we have seen after a long time or something like uh, we cheer them up okay uh, hey buddy uh, after a long time like we we had a some kind of friendship we had a some kind of uh, like emotion like that correct but for the humans like they don't have that kind of uh, uh, and not that kind of uh, emotion uh, like background so recognizing the behavior of others is very important and what one is the established consciousness with the, uh, i mean following the third point and the fifth one is uh, Um, Sophia, I mean, mainly able to understand the knowledge of uh, what people are delivering, and able to acquire new skills by meditating. Right? So those five points we have considered, and uh, like Mario, Derek, and also the Tanya, she had massive work from this understand what are the emotions that derive from that notion so like extracting the meaningful features so uh, please go to the next slide so uh, when i when i'm uh, describing this so there are five uh, main uh, sectors that we have to consider so other than the five or six sectors that i have explained in the last mm-hmm. so these five sectors are very important the first one is the visual feature input So when we are talking about visual feature encoding, it involves the identifying the surrounding environment of Sophia. So let's say if Sophia enters into room or Sophia enters into a conference room, so she is able to understand or see the things or hear the things or like uh, get the sense of the visual feature. So she is able to understand the information. And the second one is the uh, proprioceptive features. So the viewers, some viewers, some viewers that they think of okay, what is this proprioception? So the proprioception, it's actually the body's ability to sense like some movement or like action or location of the environment. So it means like uh, if let's say uh, if you have uh, like if you had eight hours after that, now we are waking up. So if you don't have proprioception, you won't be able to do or think. any human behavior because uh, without the proprioception you will be able to move or think about your next step so what i'm going to do now likewise that's what proprioceptive means so this proprioceptive speech encoding is also very important and the third and fourth is so spatio temporal pattern 
So spatial temporal mapping is like through the space and time we can see a lot of features. Uh, for example, let's say normal example like but identify like a, a unique trend in economy or so like in the weather we have uh, in the weather we can identify some trend. So that's what spatial temporal pattern learning is. So fourth point also reporting it. So we have like great many research papers can identify this as a like a very specific thing that we have considered. And the fifth one is a neural network integration. So that's basically we are trying to get like the uh, build a model to uh, do the like detention learning. So these five sectors, like uh, we, we categorize into like appearance level, action level, and purpose level. So the next slide, please. So uh, under the body and environment. So since we are actually focusing on not exact stream mechanism, but extracting the features when we are seeing the motion. So we have to uh, look into this body schema shared attention and action recognition. So if you can see the body schema, body schema actually means like uh, for a human, there are several activities. So if you can see the screen, so the human is like picking up a ball and when the process is happening, you can see like what are the like the motion forces acting on the human body and how the uh, skeleton uh, behaves. That calls the body skin. And when we are talking about shared attention, so uh, like, like a normal example is if uh, A and B person people uh, exist, so if, the, if both people are looking at some object flying through the air, let's say a plane. So if both people are looking at the plane at the same time, uh, the per, like uh, experiments, I mean, I mean, according to that A or according to B, like, Experimentally, like the perspective experiment is different. In other words, what we are seeing is uh, the thing that uh, person A sees is not the same as the, uh, the thing that person B sees. So shared attention. So the third one is action recognition. So action recognition, similar to the body schema, that actually means like identify what, are, what is the action now the person is doing right now, or clapping, or boxing, or joking, etc. So uh, under the body and environment, those things very, are very uh, like well. Next slide, please. So uh, how would this go? So as you can see in the screen, you can see like some of the like motions, like for hands in there. I think you can see the screen clearly. So arm um, crosses or like uh, biting nails, sitting with leg cross. There are so many data that you can see this slide. So what this slide means? So under the imitation learning, what we have tried to develop is we have tried to understand and see, okay, if uh, like in, in a, let's say in a party, so if people are laughing, if people are like dancing, so we can see the motions, we can see like, okay, people are moving and we, people are expressing themselves. Okay. Then there are millions of actions uh, contained there. So if, Sophia, let's say, if Sophia enters the party, Sophia able to understand what is the action happening right now. Then through that action, Sophia has able to understand okay, what is the motion right now. So if a person happy, okay, he's now like laughing or dancing or like jiggling or like that. He's very enthusiastic. If a person is very sad, so like then person tends to like isolate from others and looking at somewhere or like any other action. So Sophia has a, Sophia able to understand those type of features. So through this limitation, limitation and what we are doing is, so we have tried to develop like a more architecture that can actually uh, teach Sophia to, okay, this human is like uh, now having this emotion. So based on this emotion, uh, based on uh, this uh, like human behavior, this human has this emotion or like this type of uh, like mental state. So for that, actually, we have to focus on recognized cues like from all parts of the body, like body reading likewise. 
So I think you have, we have all read of the Sherlock Holmes books. So I think you know that Sherlock Holmes is very well known for like reading the body language. So that same thing we had tried to develop in here. Next slide, please. So this is actually estimate post using post estimator. So actually, as you can see in this slide, so this lady is dancing. And when she is dancing, you can see that the human posture is like various. That means like uh, uh, the legs and arms are now in the different positions. So when the movements is happening, so it identifies like basic, basic skeleton or basic like uh, block of what is this, uh, at, at, a, at a T instant. So what is this skeleton block now, right now? Okay, so like, Post detection actually. So this is actually a post net example taken from the TensorFlow like uh, repository. So uh, in Sophia the robot project, I mean this post estimate has been used actually. So in our project, what we have tried to develop is like so we we have we have tried to like develop further to our purpose because our purpose is to build the Sorry, they keep talking about consciousness. Yeah, that's good. Sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, talking about okay. uh, talking about the like the uh, post net example. So. Uh, what I have mentioned is like we have tried to develop the consciousness through that estimator and uh, talking about the alter tree and XIR. So uh, talking about the alter tree, actually this is, I think uh, if you have re recently read about uh, like uh, recent movements in the robotic industry. So uh, the Jap in Japan, that alter tree has able to conduct a pair and uh, like uh, Alta Tree has able to uh, give, like uh, showcase their like the uh, ethical uh, like um, uh, AI and ethical behavior. So when you are talking about Alta Tree, so as you can see in the slide also, it has two cameras. So which at each eye has the like the vision, sending the visual image to control system. So uh, it actually integrated with the open post software also. So Basically, what he's doing is like indicating the human posture. So, talking about the uh, the right side that we can see that in here that we uh, that this project has integrated with cross embodiment in uh, inverse reinforcement learning, which known as XIR. So, uh, this imitation learning actually leverages this, uh, this performing the same task differently due to the embodiment differences. So, as you can see uh, at the right at uh, the bottom. Uh, of the slide, as you can see, so the this is the perspective of, of what Alta Three can see, and uh, like that, uh, Alta Three has able to perform the XIR uh, algorithm, and to for our project actually, we have explored these projects, and we have get the idea of how to implement our idea of building the consciousness. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, so this is the main layout of the inspired imitation learning architecture. So, uh, we have developed this architecture based on like the algorithm that we have so, so far. So, um, uh, when we are looking at this so imitation learning technique architecture, so as you can see, there are three inputs. So, the first one is the visual. And the second one is the auditory one and the text based one. So there are three input types. So these three input types uh, like feed it into this architecture. So when we are feed it into this architecture, as you can see, uh, there are uh, like we have proceeded to the multimodal data. So uh, as you can see, uh, there are multimodal data and generated data. So when we are looking into the multimodal data, multimodal data refers to uh, like data which spans uh, like different types or different contexts, like 
imaging text or genetic samples. And uh, when the positive data feeded from multimodal data, also the negative data also feeded from the generators. So when we are looking into these generators, so a uh, generate role is to like to new, generate new data uh, by learning the distribution of the input data sets. Because uh, when uh, like I have explained the uh, like the behavior of the data set that we have used in the like previous slide, and I will explain in the next slide also. So uh, like in the discriminants of class, that, as you can see, so this is the, like the, uh, the extended version of uh, the architecture. So uh, the, all the data we did in the discriminator, which actually classifies the data. And this data actually uh, classified data, uh, we did it and identified as output, like 3D coordinates. And which actually based on the reward based system, which actually Ream and Derek has explained in the ethical framework. I think you, have, you guys have remembered that. So uh, we actually uh, focus into the GL uh, algorithm also generate new adversarial information learning technique. So we have get a like full exposure of those like algorithm also. And after that, uh, using the Sophia tracker module and after like proceeding with the relative post of arms and getting the data of motor angles. So we feed that data into this whole system to imitate uh, behaviors. So uh, this is a kind of summary of that we have done. And uh, please next slide. So this is the, like the data preprocessing of the architecture. So as you can see, uh, the force is there and the textual data is there and the body language is there. So uh, typically what we have done is like action recognition, emotion recognition, posture recognition, facial recognition. So there are a lot of like recognizing activities going down like in the data sets. And using those data, we actually, uh, using the discriminant, we classify it. So when we are actually classifying this, we have to understand ethical framework is embedded to that and also the motive framework is embedded to that. So like throughout the like end-to-end -end pipeline, so this is the thing that we have done so far. We have integrated the ethical framework, motive framework, and this imitation learning framework in order to build a like, good architecture. So uh, like uh, I like to hand over to the Masa for the continuation. Thank you. Uh, Mahasad, you're on mute, I think. Oh, oh, sorry. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. So, um, um, uh, so I would like thank you everyone for the presentation. Um, um, I um, appreciate uh, all your um, hard work and uh, collaboration. Uh, but uh, before ending this. Um, meeting i would like to ask um for david's feedback uh, about this uh, work and i would like to hear what he thinks about uh, this um uh, uh, like project and uh, the next phase uh, of our uh, uh, like um collaboration that is going to happen based on the proposals that are uh, given in this um uh, initial phase yeah like uh, we would love to hear from you Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, excellent work, everyone. Very, very exciting. Um, and uh, I am uh, eager to begin the next phase, going from design to implementation, prototyping, some testing. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are some uh, questions that I would have like the memory structure, I'm presuming that that's a graph uh, knowledge model within a graph database. And also that some of the me memory would be in the neural networks, but I, um, I, it's probably beyond the scope to answer at this stage, but I'm just interested in what um, in the, uh, the various knowledge models that, and architecture diagrams that we saw, um, when we see memory, uh, what, what is the structure of the memory? Um, uh, I, um, I do believe that 
Um, based on the, uh, I think this comet data set and the comet, uh, atom, comet atomic data set have been previously used uh, with some language models. Um, uh, well, uh, for the start, I would de de definitely look at the way that they have handled this into memory uh, and they have used it. But uh, at this stage, because we have not been uh, doing any implementation or like, um, um, uh, uh, like coding uh, at the initial phase, I don't think uh, we have explored that part, but um, um, like at the first phase, we were just trying to look for the gaps and um, like uh, come up with proposals and ideas that can be implemented in the second phase. But based on my understanding, this is not something that we have uh, explored, but that would be a great point to be looked at for the next uh, phase and, and to be considered. But I would, um, I mean, if anyone and any one of any one of the collaborators have any um, comment on that, I would be also happy to hear. But that's that's my take. I saw mostly KR and. Uh... Graph which ones the and certainly so the um would that graph then be uh neo 4 j as we had discussed or was there another uh graph uh system that was proposed or is that also to be decided neo 4 j or something else uh I hear somebody speaking but it's very quiet I can't yeah. Hear what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, there's some serious feedback there. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's actually new for you. Uh, maybe just type the answer on the chat and we can see it and I'll read it out loud. I see here that it says uh, uh, from uh, Prasantia uh, that yeah. it needed to be decided, but Neo4j was the plan. Yeah. And Vidur says uh, Neo4j. So uh, the thing about Neo4j is it may have scalability issues. So um, for particularly large knowledge models, it may be difficult and may also wind up being very slow uh, and computationally intensive. So um, worth looking at. Um, uh, we might also, um, can you know if we do it in the right way, it might be um, <clears throat> that we don't need a huge knowledge graph, uh, or that we have some hierarchical structure to the knowledge graph, so that in that way it's uh, only running a subset at any given time in the right way. I'm not sure how that would be managed, but to be determined, I suppose. So um, uh, we also would be good for us to look at. Um, any sort of hierarchy uh, regarding the motives and motivation, you know, like, is there something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs going from, you know, basic survival up to higher level motives, you know, like how do, how do the motives get prioritized? Um, so that would be something to, to look at as we're going into phase two. Um, uh, anyway, those are just some passing thoughts, but let me also just uh, say um, it's, uh, an impressive amount of work. Um, I, I really appreciate how you, the, the thinking of each of you has evolved as you've done the research and uh, explored this with great creativity and diligence. Um, and I'm just so honored and um, excited to work, work with you all on this. It's, um, it's a, a great privilege. Thank you. I look forward to uh, our next steps. Well, thanks so much, David, for the feedback, and we do look forward for the next uh, phase of the uh, project. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the hard work, and uh, have a great uh, rest of the day, and thanks. Bye. Thank you. Also, please share, please share the presentation uh, with me as a download. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. And the Bye. recording of this, uh, of this. Thank you. Bye.